Hey, I'm Diana Cowern, and welcome to lesson three of Diana's intro physics class, also known as AP Physics One Review, also known as Physics by Diana. So, I had this idea of a skateboarder riding on the back of a flatbed truck and doing a trick like a kickflip while the truck is moving. Sounds dangerous and crazy, I know, but hear me out. Physics explains why it should be possible. So I asked my friend about it, and then two days later, he sent me this footage. It is amazing that this is possible, which is mostly because these skaters are so talented. But also it's amazing because the physics goes against our instincts. You might think that the skateboard would do this. And that clip is also real. We'll explain what's going on with that clip in lesson four and show some of the outtakes. Outtakes. But for this lesson, we're gonna focus on how the first trick is possible. So today's lesson, motion in two dimensions. We're leveling up. We've mastered the process of modeling both one-dimensional motion, like say forward and backward motion, and falling motion, like up and down. So today, let's mash them together. That's lesson three. Two-dimensional motion, also known as projectile motion or ballistics, ballistic motion. So today's theme is vigilante justice for superheroes. <laughs> I hope you made it. It makes it special. <laughs> so credit okay. for that. <laughs> See, I have this very effective gun. And I have a brain teaser for you. Here's the question. In one hand, I have a perfectly level gun, meaning that I can shoot this hair tie perfectly horizontally. Perfectly horizontally. And in the other hand, I'm holding an identical hair tie at the same height. I'm gonna drop the hair tie simultaneously as I fire the gun. And the question is, which hits the ground first? The one that I dropped? Or the one that I fired. And I should mention, we're gonna neglect air resistance throughout this whole lesson. So first, pause the video and think about the answer to the riddle for a second. Write down your guess. You can even write it in the comments. And back to normal. Now that you have guessed, right, let's answer this question with physics. We have to talk about two-dimensional motion, which is basically thinking about objects moving both horizontally and vertically at the same time. Very coordinated objects. We're gonna need one new tool today for these kinds of problems. Here it is. So coordinated. All right, here it is. An object's horizontal motion, that's the back and forth, is independent of its vertical motion. So our new tool is that we can analyze horizontal and vertical motion separately. What does that mean? There's this cliff on Kauai, where I'm from, called Shipwrecks. It's an ominous name, but trust me, it's super fun. I used to jump off Shipwrecks as a kid. So, here's my cliff. There's me. <laughs> Am I getting any better at stick figures? Not really. There are some rocks near the edge of the water, so you have to jump out sideways far enough to land beyond any rock. Safety first. Let's model shipwrecks as our first problem to figure out how fast you would need to jump to safely clear the rocks. The cliff is about 10 meters high, and the rocks extend about one meter out. Our cliff jumper jumps out sideways at two meters per second off the cliff. She's not jumping up or down at all, just straight sideways. So given her velocity, does she clear the rocks? Before we solve this problem, let's stop and think. What does her path look like as she falls? I'll give you three options. She could go off the cliff in a diagonal line like this, or she could do the wily e. Coyote and run off the cliff in a straight line and only start falling when she realizes she's not standing on anything. Or you could imagine something somewhere in between those two and she starts to fall faster and faster as she's moving sideways. So which is it? Here's a useful thought before we answer that question. What if I were in a helicopter or maybe filming with a drone way over here? Does it look like a drone? Mm -hmm. Sweet. What does her path look like from over here? From far enough away, the jumper barely looks like she's coming towards you at all. So she just looks like she's falling. You can see this if you pour your old coffee into the sink with some initial sideways velocity. From the front, it just looks like a straight line. Similarly, if I were way above her looking down, I wouldn't be able to tell that she's falling. I would just see her sideways motion. That's also just like if you look at the pouring coffee from above, it looks like a straight line sideways. So if you're far enough away in either direction, you can't simultaneously see both types of motion happening. That's the fundamental idea here. If you change your perspective, you can see horizontal motion is independent of vertical motion. Got it? Good, cool. Back to figuring out the path. Well. Wiley Coyote is cute, but we know that that one is fake news. So, goodbye. What about the other two options? 
Since horizontal and vertical motion are independent, let's ignore the horizontal for now and only think about the vertical. What does a falling diver look like? She starts at zero and accelerates moving faster and faster. So it can't be this one. Because this path has an instantaneous downward velocity equal to the horizontal velocity, and that's what a physicist would call unphysical. So it must be this one. This is what you see if you look directly straight on to your coffee pouring out of the cup. You might have bright signs flashing in your eyes. Parabola alert! And you're right. We will prove that this is a parabola in a bit. But the question remains. Will she clear the rocks at the bottom? Let's find out. Again, we will consider horizontal and vertical motions separately. We'll start with horizontal. Oh, here's my cliff. Yay. Da da da, rocks, cliff, got it all. Is she accelerating sideways? No. She's not wearing a jetpack and we're neglecting air resistance. So horizontally, she's going a constant two meters per second until she hits the water. But for how long? What's the time, T? To find out, let's move over to vertical motion. Is she accelerating? Yes. Otherwise, she would never hit the water because she didn't start with any vertical motion. She would just shoot around the Earth. Well, technically, she would fly sideways off Earth's surface because Earth is round. But no. Gravity is accelerating her downward at our old friend g equals 9.81 meters per second squared, which I will round to 10. And now we can solve for the time. She's 10 meters up, which is like 30 feet. It's real high accelerating downward at 10 meters per second squared, so we can solve for the time it takes to fall her downtime with d equals 1 half at squared. 10 equals 1. It takes 1.4 seconds to hit the water. During that 1.4 seconds, she's also moving sideways at 2 meters per second, which means, so my t over here is also 1.4, delta x equals v times d, x equals 2 meters per second times 1.4 seconds. So she lands in the water 2.8 meters out. So she definitely clears the rocks. She's bobbing happily out there like a little dolphin. Great, now we understand our big idea for the day. Sideways motion is independent of up and down motion. And with that concept, we can already understand what's going on with that video of the skaters. Watch this video of a regular 360 flip on the ground and then watch the 360 flip on the truck. The up and down motion is the same for both. We just added sideways motion with the truck. And the sideways motion doesn't affect the up and down motion at all. You can see that. And now we can extend what we just learned into the quintessential 2D problem, projectile motion. Projectile motion is, well, it could be tossing eggs. It might be launching a cannon. Maybe projectile vomiting, if your vomit stays relatively compact. It's just an object freely moving where its only influence is the downward acceleration of gravity. What happened to this tape? We're gonna do a problem now with the classic projectile. The ball. You can stay here. <laughs> we'll make it a purple soccer ball because that's my favorite color. So you're on the field and you kick the ball up in the air and we wanna find out, given just the initial velocity of the ball, can we figure out how far the ball goes sideways and how high it goes? Let's do it. So a player kicks the ball off the ground at 20 meters per second in this direction, 37 degrees off of horizontal. That's a good angle if you want your soccer ball to go far in case you're ever measuring your soccer ball when you kick it. First, let's consider the ball's trajectory without math. It's gonna follow a parabola. All projectiles do. Ooh, oops. I'm gonna focus on a few key points in the trajectory. Like here, right after the ball leaves the foot, it's going to go up and sideways at 37 degrees. Then as it arcs up here, it has slowed down some. Why did it slow down? Well, the ball's sideways velocity isn't changing. It's the same here and here and here, but the vertical velocity is changing because gravity is accelerating it downward at 10 meters per second squared. Eventually the ball hits zero vertical velocity and stops moving up. Where in the trajectory does the ball stop moving up? Here, at the top of the flight. This point is more interesting than the others. It's here at the top of the flight where the ball stops ascending and begins falling. It's still moving sideways, but for a fraction of a second, the ball has stopped in the up and down direction. Acceleration is still 10 meters per second squared down, but the vertical velocity is zero meters per second, right at that point. And then right after that point, the ball starts moving with a downward velocity. Good. I'm going to make a claim that if you folded the trajectory in half about the middle, it would be entirely symmetric because the horizontal velocity, sine included, is constant throughout both halves. The only difference is that in the first half, the ball is going up, and in the second half, the ball is going down. Otherwise, totally symmetric. 
just like in lesson two. Okay, sweet. We've analyzed the trajectory. Let's actually answer our question. How far will the ball go sideways? Looking at the path of our parabola, it looks kind of like the cliff problem, especially this side, but we're missing some crucial information. In the cliff problem, we knew how high the jumper was when we started, but we don't know the height of the ball here. Hmm. But plot twist, we don't need the height. Instead, I can use the initial velocity, 20 meters per second at 37 degrees off horizontal, and then I'll use trig to break that initial velocity down into two components, the horizontal component, Vx, and the vertical component, Vy. And if you need a trig refresher on how to do that, you can check out the handy video we made about mathematical tools. Okay, I will calculate my horizontal component first. That's my initial velocity, 20 cosine 37. Plug this into your calculator and it's about 16 meters per second. The vertical component is my initial velocity times the sine of my angle. So 20 sine 37, this is about 12 meters per second. This is really cool, because another way to say 20 meters per second at 37 degrees is 16 meters per second sideways and 12 meters per second up. Now, calculating the sideways distance becomes easy, because if we figure out the flight time, then we can just multiply the time by the horizontal velocity, which we just found. So, what's the ball's flight time? I can figure that out with the vertical velocity. Vy is 12 meters per second and goes to zero halfway through the flight. The ball is decelerating at 10 meters per second every second. So how long will it take gravity to slow the ball down to zero? Well, that's 12 meters per second divided by 10 meters per second squared. Check the units and I get 1.2 seconds. That's how long it took the ball to go from the start to the top of the trajectory. And because this whole thing is symmetrical, then my whole flight time is twice that, which means my total flight time is 2.4 seconds. Since my sideways velocity is a constant 16 meters per second, Vx, then my total distance traveled is d equals v times t, which is 16 times 2.4, that's 38.4 meters. Ta-da! We figured out how far the ball went sideways. But if you're curious about how high the ball went, we'll use the average velocity trick from the last video. The initial vertical velocity is 12 meters per second and it ends at zero. So since acceleration is constant, the average vertical velocity is six meters per second. The ball traveled up and down for 1.2 seconds. So the height equals six times 1.2. So the height is about seven meters. I'm not even gonna write that. It's just gonna, just gonna say it. Yay, you did it. I mean, I did it, but you watched. But at the end of the lesson, you're gonna do it again. Exciting. So we added one simple idea to our toolbox today. Separate out up and down motion from sideways motion, and we already modeled some difficult ballistics physics. And we saw parabolic ballistic motion of a projectile. And here's an interesting use for that. I went up in this plane called the zero G plane a couple years ago. It's also called the vomit comet, and it allows you to experience weightlessness. You completely float in the plane as if you're in space. And how does the plane do that? Well, it's not going into space. It's still in Earth's gravitational pull, but it follows that same free fall parabolic motion that we just saw with the soccer ball. The plane literally goes up like the soccer ball and dives back down to earth following the parabola and the effect is that you feel weightless. It is epic. So that's a real life use of projectile motion. And here's an interesting aside, the pilots aren't really doing math in their head to follow the parabola. They have a little ball on a string in the cockpit and then as soon as the ball goes slack and starts to move around as if it's in free fall, they know they're doing a good job and the ball will move back and forth and they adjust based off of experience. It's really cool. So anyways, you just did a great ballistics problem. So as your prize for solving your first 2D motion problem, you get to try something harder. We're gonna solve my favorite projectile problem what I call the Romeo and Juliet problem. Rom and Jule problem. This is a fun one because it's not obvious right away how to solve it. It goes like this. Juliet is standing outside throwing eggs at Romeo's window. Here's the window. Trying to get his attention. I know, usually it's Romeo throwing rocks, but a recent archeological excavation uncovered Shakespeare's original staging before Juliet got into a bike accident and he had to rewrite it. Also, her name was actually Ethel and her dad was a pirate. Google it. So Juliet is standing four meters away from the wall and lobs the eggs at about 60 degrees from horizontal. When the egg leaves her hand, it's about one meter off the ground. The bottom of Romeo's window starts about six meters above the ground. And if you remember the scene, she's pretty worked up. So she's throwing eggs pretty hard at about 30 meters per second. That's 60 miles an hour. What is 30 meters per second in miles per hour? That would be 67.11 miles per hour. I'm doubtful unless she got a real strong arm, but you know, She's uh, passionate. So the question is, are Juliet's eggs going to hit the window and get her arrested for vandalism? She should probably just be texting him.
Anyways, she could hit the window in a variety of scenarios, on the way up, on the way down, or at the halfway point of the trajectory. We don't know. This is a tricky problem because it's not symmetrical. In the previous problem, we used the up and down time to find the sideways distance, but here we have the sideways distance, so we'll use that to calculate the time. With distance and horizontal velocity, which we'll need to find, we can calculate the time that it took to hit the wall. I will find the horizontal velocity with some trigonometry. 30 meters per second. This is clearly not 60 degrees but this is permanent it's too late to change it now okay horizontal velocity vx is the initial velocity times the cosine of 60 and that's 15 meters per second if you remember that the cosine of 60 is one half useful so it takes four meters is delta x equals my horizontal velocity 15 meters per second times t t equals four fifteenths seconds so it takes four fifteenths of a second, which is just a little above a quarter of a second for the egg to hit the wall. Now I have to figure out how high the egg hits. I can't use the symmetry argument because the trajectory isn't symmetrical. The egg ends up at a different height than where it started. So we're gonna have to pull out the heavy equipment, the equation of motion. Y equals Y naught plus V naught Y times T plus one half A. The egg's vertical position when it hits the wall is where it started, my initial position, plus the initial vertical velocity times the time in the air, plus the distance traveled due to acceleration. I know all of these things. I know my acceleration, it's 10 meters per second squared due to gravity, my time is 4 fifteenths of a second, my vertical velocity is my initial velocity, that's up here, that's my initial velocity times the sine of 60, which is about 26 meters per second. So I can plug all of that in. The egg started at one meter. The V naught Y is 26 meters per second. T is 4 fifteenths of a second, plus one half times 10 meters per second squared times this squared. Do all this math and such, and you get Y equals seven and a half meters. The final position of the egg when it hits the wall. So does Juliet vandalize Romeo's window? The bottom of the window is six meters up. So if the window is at least 1.5 meters long, then she will break the window. If the window is shorter than that, she's gonna hit just above it. And done! As we mentioned, this problem was tricky because it wasn't symmetric. But as I always say, a lot of times with these tricky problems, it's not obvious where to start, but if you could just figure out how to take one small step. Here, it was we saw that we could figure out how long it took, the time, to hit the wall, and then you can move forward with the rest of the problem, and it's doable. Now, we're done with the problems, but I promised you that I'd prove ballistic motion is parabolic, so I'm gonna do that really quickly with some cool math. The horizontal motion in any ballistics problem we can sum up as x equals vx times t, assuming that we start at x equals zero, and then the vertical position, assuming I start at zero, has an extra acceleration component. So y equals vy times t plus one half at squared, where a acceleration is g for gravity. Now I have two equations that show me the horizontal and vertical motion. Mathematicians call these parametric equations, which is just a fancy word for a set of two equations that are linked by, you guessed it, a parameter. In this case, the parameter is time. Now if we do some algebra and solve for t in terms of x, we rearrange t equals x over vx, and we sub that into our y equation, and we get y equals vy over vx times x minus one half times g times x squared over vx squared. And what shape does this equation describe? Well, y equals something times x minus something times x squared. Boom, that's a parabola. Remember, a is gravity and it's negative and pointing down. So I have my negative sign here. So it is an upside down parabola. Ta-da! <laughs> So now, using all this, let's go back to our original question. Which is gonna hit the ground first? The dropped hair tie or the one that I shoot? We should all now be able to agree, I think, that the hair ties hit simultaneously because the hair tie's horizontal motion is irrelevant to its vertical motion. It doesn't matter that one of them is traveling sideways while it's falling. So they hit the ground at the same exact time. You can see this if you balance a penny right on the edge of the table and then flick another penny next to it so that the first one gets barely nudged off the edge, but the second one goes flying. It's a fun challenge, but if you do it just right, you can hear them hit the ground at exactly the same time. 
So that's it. That's our third lesson, 2D motion. When they ask what you learned on YouTube today, here are your two important takeaways. Vertical acceleration doesn't affect the perpendicular sideways motion. And when solving hard looking projectile problems, see if you can figure out the flight time without doing too much hard work. And here are the problems we did today because the only way to really learn physics is to work the problems. So go work them again on your own. And you can find a ton more 2D parabolic motion problems online, so do it! And now is the final section where I get to tell you about some advanced but really cool physics. So we just talked about how moving forward cannot affect how fast you're falling, right? But if a tennis player hits a ball really, really fast, and if we analyzed with our 2D physics, we would calculate that it should go out. But sometimes, it doesn't. It turns out that if you hit the ball with some spin, the interaction between the air and the spinning ball causes a pressure differential that pushes the ball down faster than free fall. This is called the Magnus effect, and it's part of a branch of physics called fluid dynamics. You can also get the ball to spin sideways to curve into the goal, and if you have a really smooth ball, it actually curves the opposite way. Fluid dynamics is so weird. Here in intro physics, we don't usually take the air around us into account when we make our models. But if you stick with physics, you get to study motion in fluids like air, which is incredibly important when you build airplanes, jets, helicopters on Mars, or if you want to study things like the flow of stars through our galaxy. Really cool stuff. So I hope you do stick with physics. And now, a message for you from a surprise special guest, Carly Kloss. Surprise! <laughs> Hello, Carly Kloss here. Look, I didn't have the traditional high school experience, and I missed out on studying physics. But my biggest regret in life is not that, because now I get to, and so can you. I hope you enjoy this course, and good luck with your studies.